Okay, uh, I'm going to get started. We were having discussions about probability and statistics so far. And in the previous lecture, we talked about discrete distributions where omega, the set of all uncertainty, was a discrete set. And in particular, we looked at the discrete set 0, 1, and uh, some distributions over the space of natural numbers and distributions over the space of uh, um, uh, 0 to n. Now, in the continuous distribution, we talked about two specific distribution. One was the uniform distribution, which means that the probability density function is constant over the range, over the interval. And then we talked about normal distribution, which is actually something that is very widely used in, in the autonomous control community. So something we will touch upon again and again. Uh, today I want to talk about exponential distribution and chi-square distribution. Those are the two other distributions I wanted to talk about. So. exponential distribution in this case my omega is 0 to infinity open interval 0 to infinity and the probability density function f of y it is 1 over beta e raised to minus y over beta where beta greater than zero is the parameter for exponential distribution. It looks something like this. This is my f of y and this is my y. That's exponential distribution. Okay, so the probability density uh, goes to zero exponentially fast in exponential distribution, in exponentially distributed random variable. Where is this distribution useful? Where do we see exponential distributed random variable in our day-to-day -day activity? So do this exercise, uh, stand in front of a Starbucks or a Panera Bread or, or a restaurant and just look at the time interval between successive guests who are coming into the restaurant. So customer number one came into the restaurant and then you see, okay, after 10 seconds, customer number, customer number two went into the restaurant. After one minute, customer number, customer number three went into the restaurant and so on and so forth. So you're looking at the, the inter-arrival time between the successive customers and they are typically exponentially distributed, random variable. Now, this inter-arrival time actually appears in a lot of different situations. Um, so inter-arrival time between packets in a communication network is typically exponentially distributed. Um, uh, so uh, what else? Inter-arrival time between two customers who are coming and trying to call an Uber within, let, let's say, the OSU boundaries. Uh, that's exponentially distributed random variable. So whenever you have two independent processes and you're looking at the inter-arrival time between those two processes, then it's typically exponentially distributed. So they have to be independent. Like when I decide to go to Panera Bread is quite independent from when you decide to go to Panera Bread or when somebody else decides to go to Panera Bread. So we are all making independent decisions, but we are all going to the same destination. So if you look at the inter-arrival time, uh, it's quite likely going to be exponentially distributed, uh, especially in the high traffic regime where the traffic is extremely high. In low traffic regime, the exponential distribution is not typically the case. So uh, just something to keep in mind. Uh, another thing to keep in mind, exponential distribution is parameterized by a single scalar parameter, beta where beta is a positive number. So if you look, remember the normal distribution or the Gaussian distribution, that is parameterized by two 
quantities, mu which is the mean and sigma square which is the variance. So in exponential case, beta is the only parameter that specifies the entire distribution. Now, yeah, sure. Go ahead. Uh, so uh, why the variable y uh, is representing what you said in the example of the time interval? Right. So we have y intervals, and basically they tend to go to zero Correct. as they increase the time intervals. Again. That's right. So, so let's consider the example of Panera Bread. So we expect that the next uh, customer would arrive by 10 seconds with very high probability, but the next customer comes after 10 minutes will have very low probability. Actually, exponentially low probability. It'll be like 0 0.00001 kind of probability, right? So of course, it depends on what beta parameter for that particular Panera Bread would be. So if you are a Panera Bread in uh, downtown uh, New York, your beta is going to be extremely small because a lot of people are coming in, ordering food and going out. But if you are in, uh, I don't know, rural Ohio, then beta will be very, very small because very few people are coming in ordering food at that place. <clears throat> now consider this situation. You have, uh, you're looking, you're a, a cybersecurity uh, uh, expert in a database system. And you have a, Let's say you are managing OSU email database and you look at the inter-arrival distribution of email requests and when I'm checking my email is independent of when you are checking your email and so on and so forth for the entire OSU community. And what you notice is suddenly at a specific point of time, the number of requests for checking the email has gone up significantly. Okay, what, do, what can you infer from this activity? So every day, you know that this is what the distribution of checking your email looks like, but at a specific time, at a, on a specific day, you suddenly realize that a lot of people are checking their email, and so the inter-arrival time has changed significantly, or the distribution has changed significantly. What can you infer from that activity? Some event happened that everybody is talking about. <laughs> Sorry? Some event happened Some, that everybody okay. is talking about. <laughs> Okay, very good answer. So some event is happening and people are talking about it or people are sending email or checking email about that. Yes, that could be a possibility. What else? What will happen in this case uh, with this exponential distribution we have You're asking the question is this or? So my question is that you suddenly see that the distribution of how quickly the request for checking emails are coming has changed significantly. So the beta, let's say the beta under normal circumstances is one, uh, and, and now beta has become like uh, 2.5, suddenly, like out of a blue. And his, his hypothesis is maybe some event is happening at OSU because of which everybody's checking their email very, very frequently, okay? So they're requesting update of their inbox very frequently. So that's one legitimate argument, that's his hypothesis. And as a, as a cybersecurity expert, that could be one of the hypotheses you want to check. Like you can go to the news website and see if something has happened on the OSU campus or is there a football match or whatever, like some event that's coordinating everyone's activity for checking the email. Okay, so that's one answer. What else could be the case? Spamming. Sorry? Someone is spamming. Someone is spamming. Uh, but in spamming, you're not checking your email, right? So, um, or maybe that spam creates some, some event because of which people are checking their email. Who knows? Somebody sent an email, everybody who is from OSU gets a million dollar if you click on this link, right? So, <laughs> we all get those emails all the time, right? Right, so someone is accessing all the emails. Someone is hacking into the email system and is accessing all the emails. So that is exactly how antivirus softwares or, or uh, some of these firewalls work. So they will check if the traffic looks legitimate or not. And if the traffic is not legitimate, they will try to block that traffic. Um, and that's one of the ways for detecting attack. And so the way to detect an attack would be you keep 
estimating the parameter beta, and if you see a significant change in beta, then it means that something might, some, some adversary might have triggered that activity. So all of this is studied under the umbrella of uh, anomaly detection and hypothesis testing, which we will talk about in the future. <clears throat> The last, uh, uh, distribution I want to talk about is chi-square distribution. Omega is between zero to infinity. And f of y is, I'm going to use this is denoted by chi square k. So I know in the, in the note you have this parameter nu, but I'm going to change it to k for our discussion today. So y raised to k over two minus one, e raised to minus y over two over two raised to k by two, gamma of k by two. K is a K is a parameter. K Let me check if K is supposed to be a integer or not. Maybe it's not required to be an integer. Okay, so on Wikipedia it says that k should be integer, uh, but in the book, in this particular handout, uh, it doesn't say that k should be an integer, so I don't know. Maybe it can be generalized to situations where k may be non-integer value. But there's a reason why we people study chi-square distribution. Um, and the reason is, this y, so let x1 to xk be iid Gaussian 0, 1 random variable. So x1 to xk be iid Gaussian 0, 1. So 0 is the mean, 1 is the variance, random variables. Then y equals to summation xi square i square equals to 1 to k. This is distributed according to chi square k distribution. Oh, I didn't say what gamma function is. Uh, I have to write what gamma function is. Uh, gamma, where should I write? Let me write it here. So gamma of alpha is denoted by integral zero to infinity, t raised to alpha minus one, e raised to minus t dt. So gamma of n plus one equals to n factorial. Okay, so gamma function is actually generalization of factorial. Factorial is something we study in combinatorics. 
So gamma function uh, generalizes the notion of factorial which is defined only for uh, whole numbers, so natural numbers plus zero. Um, gamma function generalizes it to any positive real number. So alpha could be any, anything greater than zero. Uh, you can define the, uh, you can define the, uh, the gamma function in this particular way as an integral, as a infinite integral of uh, t raised to alpha minus one e raised to minus t. This integral goes from zero to infinity only, okay? So this gamma function is appearing in the denominator here. So the reason why we will study chi-square distribution, this is becomes useful when you are looking at a Gaussian random variable and you're looking at the variance of Gaussian random variables, then there is something called chi-square test where uh, you try to detect whether there is a change in the variance of the Gaussian random variable or not. And again, if you can detect a change, it might mean something is going wrong in the system. And we will study some of those tests in the next, next week. Okay, any questions so far? So all of these distributions are something that we will see we, I mean, uh, in the day-to-day -day applications, these distributions arise. Uh, we have studied like eight or so distributions. So these distributions arise in many day-to-day -day activities or detection activities. And we will use, we will come up, not, will not come up. I'm going to talk about those algorithms, those detection algorithms in the next um, week as well as in the next month in the context of cybersecurity. So that's why we are talking about all these things. Okay, any questions so far on these distributions or any of the distributions we have studied so far, uh, including discrete distributions and continuous distributions? Yes, please. How can we apply these t square uh, in a real life like Sorry? For the example, like, uh, you gave the example for that. Right, so we haven't yet talked about uh, estimators. Estimators is a topic for the next uh, class. So what happens in estimators is you are trying to estimate. So in this case, you're looking at samples of Y and you're trying to estimate beta. So when you have Gaussian distributions, uh, when you have random variables that are coming according to Gaussian distribution, uh, you want to detect a change in the variance if, if that's what you are. So you're seeing that the mean remains the same but the variance has changed. Why would a variance change? Maybe there is some attack going on underlying in that underlying system. So that detection uses this chi-square distribution uh, idea. So the variance of, variance of uh, Gaussian random variables are distributed according to chi-square distribution. So, or sum of variance of random variables is distributed according to chi-square. So that's where we will use this idea when we talk about chi-square test in the next, uh, maybe on Friday of next week. <clears throat> okay. Now the next topic that I want to talk about is joint distribution. So you have two random variables and you want to understand their joint properties. This idea is, so consider the following situation. We have this room and there is a classroom right next to this classroom on the left side and there is one classroom on the right side. And we have three temperature sensors. We have three thermostats, like one thermostat in each classroom. I think this, this classroom has one thermostat, yes. And there is one thermostat in the classroom on that side and there is one thermostat in the classroom on that side. And so each of these thermostats are measuring the temperature of the room every one minute or every five minutes, whatever that frequency may be, right? So now, what do you think if I tell you that the temperature of this room is 72 degrees Fahrenheit, what do you think the temperature of those two adjoining rooms are going to be? They share the same air conditioning system. I mean, almost the same type of students, you know, and same type of classrooms. So there may be like 10 students in one class and 20 students in another class, right? So what do you think is the temperature of these three classrooms going to be? 
if this is 72 they are also going to be roughly 72 it could be 73 it could be 71 but it can't be like this is 72 and that is 65 it just cannot happen and so that's that brings in the notion of correlation now if the thermostat of this classroom breaks down or there is an attack and the thermostat is reading i don't know 100 degree fahrenheit but there are two thermostats that are saying well the temperature is 71 degrees fahrenheit and 73 degrees fahrenheit you kind of know that either this thermostat has gone bad or there is an attack going on on this particular sensor and that's one reason why we study correlation because correlation would allow you to discard the information that seems to be coming from a rogue source from a from an adversarial source okay so that's why we are going to study correlation um, so <clears throat> okay. Let me talk about cumulative distribution functions first. So I have a random variable y that ma maps omega to r. No, let me call it x because x is what we have been using so far. Then the cumulative CDF, cumulative distribution function, is denoted by fx. And it's a function. It's a function from r to 0, 1, and it basically measures fx of, let's say, small x is, there are multiple definitions, they are all equivalent, so let me write them, equals to integral minus infinity to x, f of x dx, equal to probability of capital X in minus infinity X right I think that's all yeah so this is what the cumulative distribution function fx so this x is stands for this random variable here and this small x is a real number. And the output is actually going to be between 0 to 1. This is just a definition which we will need once in a while for some, uh, some methods, for some uh, applications. Okay. Oh, sorry. Uh, yeah. Uh, yeah. X. X. Yeah. X will not take minus infinity value, so it's not included here. Joint distribution. So I have two random variables, x1 that maps omega to r, x2 that maps omega to r. And because the underlying uncertainty is the same, uncertainty set or unknowns are the same, um, there is a possibility that the two random variables are correlated. And so the joint distribution, in the case of discrete, uh, the discrete random variables, they will be denoted by p of x1, x2. This is uh, what the joint distribution looks like. And in the case of continuous random variables, the joint distribution will have the probability density function 
this is the probability mass function and this is the probability density function. This is what it's going to look like. Let me write it as small x1, small x2. Okay, so I have, uh, let's consider the case of temperature and let's say the temperature takes only discrete values. So it can be 70, 71, 72, 73. Those are the only values that it can take. Then we will specify and there are only two rooms, this room and the next classroom. So there are only two rooms. So I will come up with a probability distribution of P7070 P7071, P7170, and so on. So this is the chance that the temperature in both the rooms is 70 degrees Fahrenheit. This is the chance that the temperature in both, in room one is 70 degrees Fahrenheit, in room two it's 71 degrees Fahrenheit, and so on and so forth. So that's the probability mass function case. where we are looking at discrete variables, so x1 and x2 are taking discrete uh, values. On the other hand, when they are taking continuous values, then we define the probability density function as f of x1 comma x2. Now the two random variables could be independent or they could be dependent. So in which setting they will be independent. So I'm looking at a room which is here in this particular building and a room in Dries lab, which is adjacent building. They don't share the same air conditioning system. They don't share anything else like the entire duct work and everything is quite different. The number of students who are coming into the building is quite different. So in that case, the two probability distributions are going to be quite independent of each other, okay? So that's the situation where looking at independent variables. So in that case, so in the case of independent random variables, so x1 and x2 are independent, then p of x1 comma x2 will be p of x1 times p of x2. Or I should write it as p1 of x1 and p2 of x2. So p1 is the distribution of x1, p2 is the distribution of x2. By the way, this is a uh, this is a notation for probability of x1 equals to x1, x2 equals to x2, and this is the notation probability of x2 equals to x2. You know, I always yeah. So this is the case for independent random variables in the discrete setting, in the continuous setting, we will have f of x1, x2 equals to f1 of x1, f2 of x2. So then they are independent. This is what will happen if they are independent random variables. So the joint distribution will be the multiplication of individual distributions.
Yes. Yes. Being at seventy, yes. Uh, well, likelihood has a specific meaning in statistics, but I guess if you are using the usual English term likelihood, then yes, that's the same same term. So essentially, like uh, the probability of like realization of the Right. So another way to think about this is 20% of the time, both the rooms are at 70 degrees, 70 degrees Fahrenheit. 10% uh, of the time, room one is at 70 degrees Fahrenheit and room two is at 71 degrees Fahrenheit. 5% of the time, room one is at 71, room two is at 70. So that's another way to think about it, if that's what you mean by likelihood. So chance, likelihood, all of these have similar meanings in English language. But then likelihood in statistics has a specific meaning, which we will again talk about in, in the future. OK. So when we talk about correlated random variables, so we talked about independent random variables. Independent case is not very useful for our setting because um, I cannot look at one random variable and extract information about the other random variable. Uh, that's what we would ideally like to do, because if my sensors are under attack, if, if I have 10 sensors, two of them are under attack, I want to be able to use the other four, other uh, eight sensors to be able to infer the values of the two sensors. Right? So, if, so consider the following example. You have four wheels on a vehicle, and one of the wheel sensors have gone bad, either because of, because of an attack, actual attack on the sensor, or because the sensor has just gone bad you still want to be able to measure the rotational speed of that particular wheel based on the rotational speed of the three other wheels you have, uh, whose sensor readings are completely uh, correct. OK. So we talked about independent random variables, and we talked about joint distribution. Let's talk about marginal distribution. So I have joint distribution P of P of x1 and x2. Then the way I define the marginal distribution marginal distribution of x1 is summation P1 X1 equals to X2 in, uh, so sum over all possible X2 of P of X1 X2. So X1 is fixed and I sum over all X2 and I get the marginal distribution of X1. The same thing can be done for X2. This is for the discrete case. And then for the continuous case, I'm just going to write it here, minus infinity to infinity f of x1, x2, dx2, and then f2 of x2 minus infinity to infinity f of x1, x2, dx1.
okay so what do we notice uh, what happens in the case of independent random variables the joint distribution is product of marginal distribution okay so this is how the marginal distribution is defined what you do is you take integration with respect to the other variable or summation with respect to the other variable well i'm i'm sure you all know by now that integration and summation are similar operations okay in the context of probability um, when you have discrete you do summation when you have continuous you do integration when you have discrete you look at probability mass function when you have in, in when you have continuous you look at the probability density function so in this case you want to find the marginal distribution of x1 you look at the joint distribution and you sum up over all possible x2 look at the joint distribution you sum up over all possible x1 you get the marginal on x2 same thing for the continuous case and when you have independent random variables what you have noticed is that the joint distribution is product of marginal in fact that is the test uh you can there are ways to ways to get uh, joint distributions uh, using data using actual data from the joint distribution you can compute the marginal distribution from the marginal distribution you can check whether the joint distribution is product of marginal or not if that is the case for all x1 x2 then you know that you are random variables x1 and x2 they are all uh, independent of each other on the other hand if you see that this doesn't hold so this is not equal to p of p1 of x1 times p2 of x2 for some x1 x2 pairs then there is a correlation between the two random variables okay so that's one way to test it now how do you get the probability measure we'll again talk about it in the future when we talk about histogram and estimates <clears throat> okay so this is the way to so this is the the definition of marginal distribution any question on this definition so we have understood two things we have two random variables temperature of this room and temperature of that room um so uh, for x1 x1 then uh, for like uh, x1 x1 uh, we are keeping x1 constant and like integrating over integrating over x2 yeah so x1 is constant and x2 is being integrated over in this case x2 is constant x1 is being integrated over okay and the limit i have written as minus infinity to infinity but of course you have to change the limit depending on what the range of x1 and x2 is so some in some cases it's zero to infinity in some cases it's minus infinity to infinity <coughs> okay now the next topic that i want to talk about is uh conditional distribution okay so we have understood the joint distribution we have understood the marginal distribution now is the right time to talk about conditional distribution conditional distribution let's again talk about the uh, 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 probability mass function case so p of x1 given x2 is defined as p of x1 x2 over p2 of x2 so the joint distribution divided by the marginal distribution
we can uh, come up with a more complicated version of this conditional distribution. So what's the probability that x1 is in A given x2 is in B? This is the joint probability x1 in A, x2 in B over probability x2 in B. Or if I want to be a bit more accurate, probability x1 in uh, the entire set R and x2 is in B. Which is of course this denominator is of course same as probability x2 and b. So the, here a and b are events. a, b are subsets of r. So all of these are sort of equivalent ways of de uh, denoting conditional distributions. And de depending on the book you are going to read, you will see one of these definitions in those books. What is the operational meaning of conditional distribution? So given that I have observed x2 to be the case, what is the probability distribution over x1? What's the probability that x1 is equal to x, so random variable x1, capital X1 is equal to small x1, given that random variable x2 is equal to small x2. So that's given by this particular expression. What is the chance? That that's going to be the case. Let me again go back to our example, temperature examples. If P of 70, 70 is 0 0.5, P of 70, 71 is 0 0.2, P of 71, 71, 0 0.2, P of 71, 70. Okay, 71, 70, 71, 71 is 0 0.1. Let's say this is what my probability distributions look like. The joint distribution between the temperature of the two rooms. Then what is the P1 of 70? What's the marginal on 70? So I just have to keep x1 constant. So I have to keep the 70 constant. I have to sum over all possible values of x2. So that 0 0.5 plus 0 0.2 equals to 0 0.7. What is P1 of 71? 0 0.2 plus 0 0.1 equals to 0 0.3. What is P2 of 70? So I have to keep 70 constant as x2 and I have to sum over all x1, so 0 0.5 plus 0 0.2 equals to 0 0.7 and P2 of 71 is 0 0.3. This is how we would compute the marginal distribution. So I've collected data and I have computed that these are the chances that both temperatures are 70, one temperature is 70, other one is 71 and so on and so forth. So I've computed this probability distribution, the joint distribution between the two random variables and I have computed the marginal in this case. And 
Let's see whether they are independent or not. Okay, so how do we check for independence? What is P of 70? 70, that is 0 0.5, which is not equal to P1 of 70 times P2 of 70, which is 0 0.49. So therefore, they are not, they are uh, correlated random variable. They are not independent random variable. Because I found one pair of realizations for which the joint distribution is not equal to the product of marginals. Just one is good enough, okay? With one example, I can show that they are independent random, uh, they are dependent random variables. Okay, everything is clear so far with this example? So they are dependent, yeah, go ahead. So uh, just to make sure, uh, the, the P170 means that the, the probability of room one having is 70 degrees. Yes. So you take both of the, yeah. Yeah, you take uh, x2 equals to 70, x2 equals to 71, and you add it up. Okay. So 0 0.5 plus 0 0.2. This is still not like conditional. It's still not conditional. Now I'm going to talk, the, talk about conditional probability. So now we have learned about the joint distribution. We have learned about the uh, marginals. Now I want to know, I'm curious that I want to know if x1 equals to 70 given x2 is equal to 71. What's the probability? So I, I have observed room two. I'm in room two, and I went to the thermostat, and I looked at the temperature, and it seems to be 71 degrees Fahrenheit. Now, I'm curious to know what's happening at room zero, oh, sorry, room one. What's the temperature like? So there are only two options here. What's the probability that x1 is equal to 71, given x2 equals to 71? And what's the probability that x1 is equal to 70, given that x2 is equal to 71? So I'm just going to apply this expression. And I have p of 70, 71, given p1, p2 of 71. What is that equal to? 0 0.2. What is P2 of 71? 0 0.3. 0 0.67. Let's look at the second case. P of 71 comma 71 over P2 of 71. It's 0 0.1, 0 0.3 equals to 0 0.33. Okay. So I'm looking at, I'm in room 2. I saw the thermostat temperature is 71. With probability 0 0.67 or with chance 0 0.67 or 67% of the time, room 1 will be at 70 degrees Fahrenheit. On the other hand, 33% of the time, room 1 is going to be at 71 degrees Fahrenheit. Okay? So it's more likely that room 1 is going to be at 70. It's less likely that room 1 is going to be at 71 degrees Fahrenheit. Okay, now you can think about it in multiple contexts. You have an aircraft engine and you're looking at a temperature sensor of the aircraft engine and you're looking at what happens before the engine, what's the temperature before the engine, what's the temperature after the engine, uh, like in the exhaust area, so that you can measure what's happening inside the engine. Is, is the fuel getting burned? Is the fuel not getting burned? Is it getting enough oxygen? It is not getting enough oxygen. 
Is there something wrong with the engine or not? Right? So you look at these correlations and you try and identify what is the chance, what's the probability that something might have gone wrong inside the engine. So all of those computations are constantly done within the engine and within the rest of the aircraft uh, for measuring if something has gone wrong or not. And if something has gone wrong, pilot gets informed. Right? In a vehicle case, um, you could have two observations of the same event. So here is the situation. I'm driving my vehicle and my camera, my vehicle camera tells me it's red light. But the infrastructure uh, uh, transponder, the DSRC transponder, which is sending information about the traffic light to the vehicle, it's saying that it's green light. What do I do, right? Should I believe my own sensors, which is saying that it's red light, or should I believe the environmental sort of communication device, which is saying that it's a green light, right? So we are in a situation where we don't have enough we have to look at the correlation and we have to figure out what is right and what is wrong. And in some of these situations, things are safety critical. It's not that simple that I'm going to reject my camera's input and I'm going to assume that that is right or, or vice versa. Like it, it becomes a very complicated problem, which is primarily the reason why um, you have to have a lot of redundancies. Because when you add redundancies in the system, so, uh, so in this case, the way you can add redundancy is you can ask all the vehicles around you, do you think that camera is, uh, that, that uh, light is red or that light is green? So now you are adding redundancies in the system. And when you add so many redundancies, you will know what the joint distribution looks like. And you can actually figure out what the true state of the world is, or at least you have a more, a higher confidence of the true state of the world uh, so that you can take appropriate action. So if it is red light with uh, probability 0.999, you will stop. If it is green light with probability 0 0.999, you will continue to cross the intersection. Okay, so you, in, in safety critical systems, you don't want these probabilities to be these conditional probabilities. So this is all the information you have. This would be the true state of the world. Okay, so what's the true color of the light? Based on all the information I've received, I've asked my neighbors, I've looked at my own camera input, I've looked at the input from the DSRC uh, transponder, which is at the traffic intersection. And I've looked at all these inputs, and I'm trying to figure out what the true state is, and I'm only going to take an action if this number turns out to be 0 0.99999, okay? Otherwise, I'm, I'm going to ask someone to do something about it. I'm going to ask the driver to take over the wheel, because nobody, my camera can be hacked, other cars can be hacked, but a human driver's eyes cannot be hacked, okay? So, you will yield the control to the human driver and they will take care of the vehicle at that time. Okay, so that's the, that's the idea. And that's why we are studying conditional distribution. The conditional distribution also becomes useful when you want to detect attacks. Okay, so this is a situation where you just have to make a decision uh, based on what different sources of information is telling you. But you could have different sources of information and this part would be, is there an attack happening or is there no attack happening? And given that I have received so much of information, what's the probability that an attack is happening? If it is overwhelmingly high, I'm going to raise an alarm and say that, hey, look, something's going wrong. Um, and if not, then I will not raise an alarm and, and let the things uh, go as usual. So we talked about the conditional distribution for the discrete case. We will talk about it for the continuous case on Monday's class. And uh, then we will talk about covariance and order statistics. And then we'll get into estima estimation. So thank you for your attention. See you on, uh, on Monday. Have a great weekend.